talk was delivered by Dr. Herbert M. Shelton at Miami Beach, Florida on May 8, 1953. Friends, is this for a National Democratic Convention or a National Republican Convention instead of a health convention? I would introduce our next speaker somewhat as follows. It is my pleasure to present a man from that great state of Texas, Dr. Herbert M. Shelton. doesn't make a great deal of difference where one is from. I remember once writing an article exposing a fraudulent method of diagnosing disease, exposing what is known as iry diagnosis. A method of telling what's wrong with you and even what your grandparents died of by gazing into the irises of the eye. Dr. Lindlar, I mean the old Dr. Lindlar, the father of the present hoopla evangelist who's on your radio here, <laughs> was a great exponent of our diagnosis. And all he said with reference to the article is, who is this fellow Shelton and where did he come from? And my reply at the time was, and that was about 25 or 26 years ago, it doesn't matter where I came from. The only thing that matters is where am I going? I had begun to think this evening I was going to go home and go to bed. I knew that I was scheduled to speak sometime tonight, but I didn't know that it was going to be after midnight. <clears throat> I, 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 have, I have told Dr. Tom John Kersio that in subsequent conventions, speakers are going to have to be controlled. And those that insist upon taking advantage of the opportunity to spout and overrun their time are going to have to be in future excluded from the platforms of the hygienic society. We cannot talk to you people about conserving your energy and so at the same time keeping you here until after midnight. Of course, it may be all right to keep you here till after midnight if we feed you plenty of eggshells. But we didn't come out here to hand you any of that kind of hokum. We're teaching hygiene. Now, I'm supposed to talk to you on the conservation of human energy. I'm going to try to do it as quickly as I can so we can go home and conserve some of it. <laughs> energy is for use. It is the ability to carry on the functions and the activities of life. We do not know what it is. We do not need to know what it is. We need only to know the conditions of its acquirement, of its recuperation, of its conservation, and of its dissipation. The laws of its operations. If we know these, then we can have an abundance of energy, or we can dissipate our energies by choice. And I'm not going to attempt to tell you, or even to guess for you, what human energy or what nerve energy is. I don't know an electrical engineer or a scientist that deals with electricity in the world that could tell you what electricity is. I know a lot of people 
It can give you light and heat and power and radio and television and various other electrical phenomena simply because they know the conditions for the generation of electric power, the conditions for its transmission, the laws of its operation, and they know also how to dissipate it. without knowing what it is. And if we know these things, too, about human energy, about nerve energy, we can deal with the energies of the body with the same exactness, with the same precision, as the electrical engineer deals with electrical phenomena. Energy is used in work, in activity, all kinds. Wholesome activities, unwholesome activities. Normal activities, abnormal activities. All kinds of work, all kinds of activity. The batting of the eye, seeing, hearing, smelling, feeling, tasting. All of these things use energy. The pulsations of the heart. The rise and fall of the chest in breathing. The digestion of food, the secretion of digestive juices the secretion of the internal secretions of the body, the hormones, walking, even standing, uses energy. That's what it's for. If it couldn't be used, well, then it would be useless. We wouldn't have any need to conserve it, nor to worry our heads over it. We have it for use. But instead of confining ourselves to the leg legitimate use of our energies, we have in modern times at least dedicated ourselves to the dissipation of energy. Instead of building our, our lives on the principle of con conservation of energy, we build them on dissipation. We waste energy. In many ways, we waste it. We overeat. It has been estimated, and I do not believe that the estimate is accurate. It does not have to be accurate. It has been estimated that it requires as much energy to digest and carry through the alimentary canal three square meals a day as it does to do eight hours of hard physical labor. Even if it only requires half as much energy to do that as it does to do the eight hours of labor, it still means that overeating puts a tremendous tax up, up, upon the body's energy reserve. What is overeating? We could say that overeating is eating beyond the needs of the body. But that wouldn't be exactly accurate because the body may need that which it is incapable of making use of. So we may define it a little differently and say that overeating is eating beyond the body's capacity to utilize. Our orthodox food scientists, as they like to call themselves, work out your food needs on the basis of so many calories a day for an individual of a certain size or, and doing a certain amount of work. And if that individual becomes ill, he needs a certain amount of calories. So they try to feed him that particular number of calories each day, despite the fact that he may be absolutely unable to digest and assimilate the slightest bit of the food that is put into his digestive tract. That person, if he only eats a spoonful, is overeating. And that food that he cannot digest and cannot assimilate must be gotten rid of at expense of precious energy that is more urgently needed for some other momentarily or temporarily more important work in that sick organism. We know, for example, that when we stop food intake in the case of sickness, that the body's energies are concentrated upon the work of excretion or elimination. 
But when we feed under these same circumstances, much of the energies of the body must be utilized in digesting and assimilating the food, or in cases where there's no digestion and assimilation, in expelling the unwanted and unuseful food. So overeating may mean one thing to one person and something else to another. Just as overwork may mean one thing and something else to another. I remember I used to be warned very frequently by my mother and later by my wife that I was straining myself. I was overtaxing myself when I was lifting what to me seemed a very light weight. But what to somebody else was not even liftable. In other words, one is lifting 400 pounds of weight regularly in his exercise program and you hand him a 100 pound barbell to lift, why well, it comes up with such ease that the person is likely to say, well, that thing doesn't weigh much. Uh, but another person who can't lift 100 pounds may find 50 pounds very heavy. So what's heavy to one person may be light to another. What is overwork to one person may be easy work for someone else. It depends upon the strength and the energy and the general condition of the individual, whether or not a given amount of work is overwork. But many of us do overwork. Perhaps I overstressed, overstated that when I said many of us. A few of us do anyhow. <laughs> I mean overwork in the conventional sense of that term. A man who smokes, a woman who smokes, is overworking his or her organism. Why? A man who drinks coffee, or a woman who drinks coffee is overworking his or her organism. Now I know if I say to you, you shouldn't drink coffee, you'll tell me, oh, I don't drink strong coffee. I always diluted it. I only drink weak coffee. <laughs> and if I say smoking is injurious, you should not smoke, I get the reply, oh, I only smoke once in a while. I only smoke a pack a week or a pack every two days something of that kind. It is said that four out of five American men smoke today, and three out of five American women. And I believe it's a pack of package and a half of cigarettes a day for each man on the average, and about a pack a day for each woman on the average. And this smoking program is increasing year by year. You wouldn't have radios in the country if you didn't have cigarette factories because they support the radios and make it possible from the, for them to operate. And they support the radios and make it possible to for them to operate because they can collect off you. The man who buys cigarettes pays for the radio program. He pays for all the other advertising that brings you all the other lies about the gentle tobaccos that don't scratch your throat. <laughs> you know, of course, that it's only old gold that don't scratch your throat. All the others do scratch. <laughs> uh, you know, of course, that it's only the king-size cigarettes that filters the smoke further, farther is, and, and it scratches your throat least. The short ones, well, they don't filter the smoke far enough, so they scratch your throat. Of course, you never stop to think what happens to your throat when you've burnt the king-size one down to where it's short, too. It's no longer filtering the smoke so far, and it begins to scratch. But each cigarette, if you listen to the radio advertising, each cigarette is the best. And each cigarette is the only one that doesn't hurt you. All the others are hurtful. Now they're telling the truth about all the others and lying about their own.
But I've told you before that every year the advertising specialists of this country, the advertising men, the men who write the advertising copy, have a convention like this. They meet. Of course, it isn't exactly like this because they drink and they smoke. And in other ways, they have what they call a good time. But one of the things they invariably do, every year this takes place, they come together in their conventions, they pass a resolution declaring for honesty in advertising. And then they go home and spend the rest of the year taking up the biggest whoppers that can come into their minds. Then they atone for that by passing another resolution next year. When you take these poisons, tobacco poisons, of which nicotine is only the worst, there's about 14 or 15 others in it. When you take the poisons of coffee, of which caffeine is only the most abundant and the most poisonous, there are several others in coffee. When you take the poisons of tea, and of cocoa, and of chocolate, and of the various soft drinks, that are sold to the public. And I wonder if you know why they call them soft drinks. Because they are sold to soft sap. <laughs> when you take all of these poisons into your body, what do you think the body has to do? It has to eliminate them. At an expense to its precious vital energy. It costs to eliminate those things from the body. You say, oh, I feel good when I take a cup of coffee. Of course you do. It's, sti it's a stimulant. And what is a stimulant? It is a poison that when taken into the body occasions enough excitement throughout that body that the increased activity gives you a feeling of well-being. But that excitement, that increased activity is a waste of nerve energy. And it is just as true of the drugs of the physician when he gives them to the sick as, they, as it is of these popular drugs that you buy without a physician's prescription and take when you think you are not sick. Oh, you're sick, all right. Anybody who is a dope addict is a sick person. You want that? I don't need it. I, I really don't have to lean on it. <clears throat> Anybody who is a dope addict is a sick person. And the only reason that he returns time after time to his dope is in his, <clears throat> because he is searching through re of his nervous system for what he calls relief from the unease, the misery, and the positive pain that has been produced by his prior use of the same dope. There is no such thing as a craving for a drug. <clears throat> Your soda fountain slops are all poisonous. And yet today, you go into a place of business and you want to see the head of the business. And you ask the girl at the counter for Mr. Big, and she says, I'm very sorry. He just stepped out for a crap bottle of Coca-Cola. Or he just stepped out for a cup of coffee. Or he just stepped out for a glass of beer. If you'll sit down, he'll be back in a few minutes. Well, you sit down and you wait a little while and he doesn't come back. So you decide you can't wait any longer. So you tell the girl, I'll be back this afternoon. That afternoon you come back and you go up to the, to the counter and you say, uh, Miss Jones, is it possible for me, see, me to see Mr. Big now? I'm sorry, he just stepped out for a cup of Coca-Cola, glass of Coca-Cola. They dope themselves at all hours of the day and night with coffee, with tea, with soda fountain slops, with alcohol, with tobacco. Over and over, it's not just two or three times a day. It starts when they get out of bed in the morning, 
It ends when they go to bed at night in most cases, but some of them get up at night and sit on their bedsides and smoke. And every once in a while you read about somebody setting his bed on fire and burning up. A kind of an ironic justice. All of this poisoning of the human body dissipates human energy, keeps the user in a constant state of innervation. At all times on the verge of sickness, I mean of acute illness, at all times in a state of chronic illness, and just on the verge of an acute illness. Let some little unusual stress or strain be thrown upon that individual. A little extra work, a little heavier meal than usual, a little extra worry, a little extra cold, or a hot day. He's down with a fever, a cold, an influenza, a pneumonia, or something else. Because he was so low in energy, consequently so toxemic, that just a slight bit more of enervating influence brought to bear upon him, and he went under. Old Mother Nature had to put him in bed and hang out a sign saying, closed for repair. She puts that sign right here. There's a coated tongue. There's a bad taste in the mouth. There's pasty teeth. There's a lack of desire for food. And that's the sign that says closed for repairs. So you call in a physician. He comes in and he looks very wise. Well, they are wise. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> he looks at your tongue. He counts your pulse. He takes your temperature. He listens to your chest. Yes, you've got pain here or there. Perhaps he thumps your abdomen a little bit. He looks you over. And he says, you've got to eat to keep up your strength. <laughs> and they keep them eating until they, to keep up their strength until they die. The graveyards are filled with people that are dead because they kept on eating to keep up their strength after old Mother Nature had hung out a sign saying, closed for repair. Well, I tell you, these fellows that have had four years in the Class A Medical College really are wise boys. They know all much more than old Mother Nature does. <laughs> all of this means dissipation of energy. Worry. Fear, anxiety, jealousy, self-pity, anger, all of the so-called destructive emotions rapidly dissipate energy. Fear is such a great nerve annihilator that it may so exhaust your energies and exhaust them so rapidly as to bring about instantaneous death. Grief is so exhausting of energy that... It may put one to bed with a severe illness. So true is this, that in hygienic circles, we have a slogan that we express in these words. You are either poised or poisoned. That is, mentally and emotionally, you are poised, or else you are unpoised, and you are consequently so badly enervated from a waste of nerve energy through emotionalism, and consequently so toxemic that we say you're poisoned. And we mean it literally, not figuratively. You're either poised or poisoned. All excesses, not merely overeating. I, I mentioned here the other day that I, I observed the people on the streets here and on the shore that come down here to get sunshine. Now, I know that sunshine is a cure-all, 
I know that no matter what you have wrong with you, you can just take plenty of sun and get well, in spite of your drinking of coffee and tea and beer and soda fountain slops and eating of white bread and white sugar and white rice and embalmed meats and pasteurized milk and canned foods and all that kind of stuff. You can go on and eat all those things you want to and just get some sunshine and everything is lovely. So, of course, there is an old principle that the more of a good thing, the better. And let's get it all in one day. Let's roast and toast ourselves in the sunshine until we look like boiled lobsters. I was told by a young lady here today that to take some of them come here and take, get so much sun and that they're prostrated and they send them to the hospital. No, it can't be overdone, you know. Any good thing must be just, you can just take all you want of it. You couldn't possibly overdo sunbathing. That's one of the greatest difficulties I have with my patients. I give them specific instructions just how much sunshine to take. And I have to watch them like a hawk to keep them from going out and toasting themselves. You can take <coughs> too much sunshine much easier than you can take too much food. And you can spend too much time in bathing. You know how we bathe? We fill up the tub with water. We get in and we lie there. Perhaps we have a book to read. Or we do a little singing. But we just keep lying there and soaking ourselves and soaking ourselves and soaking ourselves. And we soak and we soak and we soak. When we get up, the ends of our fingers are actually shriveled up because uh, substances have been extracted from our bodies by that soaking process. Not just the ends of the fingers, but from the whole body. How do you take, how do you wash your face? Do you fill the lavatory full of water and stick your face in it and hold it in there for half an hour? Of course not. You wash your face quickly and get it over with. And you dry your face and go on about your business. And that's the proper way to take a bath. Do you first put your Face in water just as hot as you can bear and soak it in hot water for a while and then put it in ice water or nearly ice water and make it as cold as you can bear and, and, and then go and dry it off. Well, that's the way a lot of us do with our bathing. We take hot baths and we take cold baths and we take a hot bath and follow it with a cold bath. We're like the old people who depended on what they call hydrotherapy or the so-called water cure. I remember when I used to dunk them in the hydrotherapy for treatment myself. I'd stick them over in a tub of hot water and then over in a tub of cold and back in that hot and over in the cold in, a, in an alternate hot and cold sitz bath, for example. Put them in a sweat cabinet and turn the heat on until uh, it went way up and they sweated and they sweated and they sweated and all they got out was water. And we'd give them a glass of water to drink and put it all back again and let them sweat some more. And then after we thought we had toasted them and roasted them long enough, we took them out of the cabinet and put them up in a little stall and we played a nozzle of cold water up and down their spines. First you stimulate them to the nth degree with heat and then you stimulate them to the nth degree with cold and then you wrap them in a blanket and put them to bed. And they need it. If anybody ever needed to go to bed for a rest and a sleep, the man or woman who's been through a process of that kind needs it. We did that, of course, in those days <laughs> to cure their diseases. Nothing like torturing the human body in every way possible. Boil them and broil them and fry them and freeze them and hash them and electrocute them and punch them and, and maul them and twist them and pull their legs and treat them in all kinds of ways. They call it physical medicine nowadays. We used to know it as hydrotherapy, osteopathy, chiropractic, massage, electrotherapy, and other such names as that. But now they, that the medical profession has adopted it and sanctified it and decided it's scientific, it's physical medicine. 
It's just as foolish after it became physical medicine to torture the human body in those ways and waste its energies by that kind of stimulation, mechanical stimulation, thermal stimulation, electrical stimulation. As it was to do it when it was called by the names that they insisted represented quackery. Well, it used to be quackery. It isn't anymore. It's now scientific physical medicine. It's just as wrong now as it was then. What is quackery? I bet we've got a lot of German people in this audience that know the German, some of them know the German language. And they know that the word quack is merely a shortening of the German word quacksalver, which is equivalent to the English word quicksilver, which is the same as the English word for mercury. A quack originally was a man who treated his patients with quicksilver or quacksalver. A poison doctor, as they used to call them in Germany. Quacksalver. A quack. Now, the quacks apply the term to everybody who doesn't poison his patients with quacksalver. The real quack. In the real meaning of the word, the real quacks, the only quacks in the world, are inside of the profession that calls itself scientific medicine. so-called. The so-called healing art. There isn't any healing art. Healing is a vital process. It takes place from within. And nobody has anything that he can add to your body or take out of your body or put onto your body or inject into you anything else that'll heal you. You either heal yourself or you're not healed. There's no healing art. There's no science. There's no art of medicine. And there's no such thing as a medicine, which means a healing agent. There are healing processes, but these are within. And everything that you do that weakens your patient, everything that you do that enervates that patient, impairs that healing process. I remember in the good old days when I used to run these colonic laundries. I used to wash out the colons of my patients on the theory that I was washing out the sources of poison. Toxins are absorbed from the colon, we were taught in those days. Oh, there are a lot of people who still believe it. Of course, they haven't read any of the more recent books on physiology, textbooks of physiology, or they'd know better, but that doesn't make any difference. They still believe it. I, I discovered in, in using the things on myself that they left me very weak. And I found they did the same thing for my patients. And I said to myself one day, why do I have to keep doing for my patients things that I know are enervating my patients, that are wasting their energies? And it puzzled me. I kept puzzling over it and puzzling over it. And then I, one day I told a funny story. I, at least I thought it was funny and my audience laughed. When I was a young boy in Texas, I used to be nursemaid to a herd of cows. I wasn't a cowboy, but, but my father had a dairy. And I used to help take care of those cows. And I took them to the pasture each morning. And I, I went out and gathered them up and brought them back in the evening. I told this story about noticing one of the cows one morning when I took the cows to pasture, dragging along behind. She seemed to be rather sluggish. I got her in, brought them all to the pasture, and I noticed she didn't eat. I went back in the evening to get the cows, and I got all the cows rounded up, and I, that one was missing. So I searched for her, and I got over into the brush, and I found the cow over there all by herself. And she had a great big enema bag hanging on a tree, giving herself an enema. Now, the fact is, animals fast when they're ill, and they, some of them fast in the mating season, and some of them fast through the winter in the hibernation season, and some of them fast all through the su summer season in what's known as estivation. That is, in the tropics, even here in Florida, and in Texas, and in Arizona, and in New Mexico, we have many animals that fast through the dry season, through the hot season. They, they go into a period of 
almost suspended animation that's known as estivation rather than hibernation. And they go through the whole time, sometimes as much as six months, without food. They never take animals. Now, I said to myself, if animals don't need animals, and they sometimes fast, well, some of them have been known to fast for as long as seven years. The Alaskan fur seal bull fasts from four to five months through the whole of the mating season, every year. And he's incessantly active 24 hours of the day during that entire period of time, physically and sexually active, guarding his harem against the other bulls that might try to steal them from him, and so forth. And he doesn't take an enema. Four to five months of fasting and no enemas. And he doesn't die of those supposed int toxins that are going to be reabsorbed. I kept thinking over this fact that animals don't need them. I said to myself, why do human beings need them then? So I, I went back into the literature of fasting. I went way back. Back to the days of Jennings and Graham and Trawl and on up through the days of Dewey and Tanner. And I discovered they didn't use animals in fasting back there, and their patients got well very nicely without any trouble. Dr. Linda Burfield Hazard was the one who introduced, it, introduced the enema practice into the fasting procedure. She tried her best up until the very day Dr. Dewey died to get him to use enemas in his fasting patients and refused to do it. She tried her best to get Dr. Tanner to do the same thing and he refused to do it. I found Dr. Page didn't use it in his fasting patients. I found it in some of the experiments that had been made in the research laboratories where men had fasted from 30 to 40 days uh, 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 for scientific research. No enemas had been employed in those cases. Nobody died. Nobody became ill. Nobody was poisoned by the absorption of those toxins that come from the colon. So I very cautiously, very gradually, began to see if my patients couldn't get along without enemas. And I soon found that they could. They not, alone got, not only got along without them, they did better without them than they had ever done with them. I, I have been instrumental during the course of the years in inducing a number of doctors of various kinds to give up the enema practice, and I have never known one of them who gave it a fair trial who ever returned to it. He was better satisfied without it than with it. Why must we enervate people? We should attempt in all ways in dealing with the sick to conserve, not to dissipate the energies of those patients because it is upon the, uh, the energies that they have that they must depend for recovery. I was once called to see a woman who was in bed, too weak to get around, I examined her, I didn't find anything particularly wrong with her, she was just weak. I said, what have you been doing? She said, I haven't been doing anything. I said, we've got to find some means to account for this weakness. So in the course of questioning her, I found that she had been for several months getting chiropractic adjustments every day. When I studied chiropractic, I was taught to adjust my patients not more than three times a week and about every four to six weeks give them a two weeks vacation from adjustments. Otherwise we would over adjust them. In other words, we make them worse. And here was a chiropractor adjusting this woman every day, week after week, until he put her in bed on his back, on her back. Why? Can't keep pounding on that human spine applying that quick, sharp, mechanical thrust to the spine and thus mechanically irritating the spinal centers without ultimately exhausting those centers, producing innervation. It's one of the reasons I discontinued chiropractic. It was the first reason that caused me to discontinue because I couldn't make it work. And I didn't see any of the other chiropractors making it work. Oh, I know people do get well under chiropractic, but they also get well while they're taking Lady E. Peacom's vegetable compound. 
they get well while they're buying these fraudulent vitamins from the department stores and the drug stores and the so-called health food stores and other places that peddle these panaceas for what ails you. Yeah, they get well under Christian science jollying. They get well in all kinds of ways. They get well when they do nothing at all. Mankind has been getting well under the worst kinds of abuses to which the human body has been subjected by the practitioners of the various schools of healing all down the ages. The human organism is tough. It's hard to kill. And its processes of recovery are always and at all times and under all circumstances in operation. Oh, Mother Nature is constantly endeavoring to restore us to health. All the schools of healing ride to glory on the self-healing powers of the body. The physician takes the credit for the cure or the recovery. As an old doctor in Chicago said many years ago, Nature cures the patient. The physician only passes the hat. <laughs> well, nature restores a lot of them to health in spite of crucifying treatment. But a lot of them are killed by the same treatment who otherwise would recover. Would recover. Any kind of treatment, it doesn't matter what it is, that dissipates the energy of the patient, lessens the possibility of that patient's recovery. In the case of drugging, I don't believe anybody would ever recover under drug treatment were it not for the fact that Mother Nature is capable of quickly establishing toleration, which is a means of defense against drugs. If she could not quickly establish that toleration, the physician would kill every one of his patients within a few days by his poisoning practices. We poison them into good health. We poison them because they're sick. That is the, has been the practice of medicine since before the dawn of recorded history. It is their practice today. And these things waste the energies of life. As a matter of fact, what is so-called drug action? I heard somebody talking from this platform here today and talking about certain particular materials. I believe it was uh, chlorine and fluorine and something of that kind being active agents. Active, my eye, there is an urge to dry a stick or a clot of earth. Action. What does the action when you take a drug into your body? If it's a drug that acts, then you don't lose any energy. But it is the body that does the act. Suppose you take a cathartic. You have a violent bowel movement. Is it the drug that moves the bowels, or do the bowels remove and expel the drug? Is the violent action drug action, or is it bowel action? What act, which act is action which is acted upon? Which moves and which is moved? You answer that question for yourself, and you have the solution to the tremendous amount of energy that is wasted in, move, in removing toxins from the body, poisons, drugs of all kinds. It requires the expenditure of energy to expel these things from the body. Now, we have these many ways of dissipating our energies, overwork, excesses of all kinds, such as overeating, overbathing, over sunbathing, sexual excesses, and other types of excesses. Now, what is excess? Excess is the overuse of the normal things of life. You should learn to be moderate in the use of those things that are normal to life. It is not proper to talk about moderation in smoking, moderation in drinking, moderation in the use of tea or coffee. You can't be moderate in the use of these things because you can't use them to start with. You can run them through your body, but you make no use of them. 
You can't any more talk about moderation in, in alcoholism than you can legitimately talk about moderation in theft. How many horses does a man have to steal, steal a year uh, at, before he gets beyond the point of moderation in stealing? How many houses must he burn each year before he is immoderate in arson? How many women must he rape before he becomes immoderate in rape? How many men must he kill because, before he becomes immoderate or excessive in murder? Oh, I know if you kill enough of them in war, you become a hero. As a matter of fact, the more you kill, the more medals and badges they pin on you. And then you proudly wear them for the rest of your life. Talk about how many men I killed. Cutting each other's throats and calling it patriotism. What an operation. And what for? That's what every soldier in Korea is asking himself today. What am I doing this for? Why am I over here? I don't mean just on our side. I mean on both sides. In all wars, the soldiers have asked themselves on both sides, why are we killing each other? We never had even had been introduced to each other. We've got nothing against each other. And here we are killing each other, cutting each other's throats and blowing each other's heads off. That's the way to be a hero. We had 16 million me young men in the United States in that back in, in 1941, who were such heroes that they didn't have guts enough to say no. Uh, I don't believe uh, I don't believe there's a government on the earth that could put 16 million men in jail because they refuse to be drafted. That's a democratic process, drafting you. And they took draftees out to preserve democracy. Uh, I sh I'm wrong there. To make the world safer, hypocrisy. <laughs> to get back to it, this, my, my, this question of moderation and excess. Now, it, just as it is impossible to be moderate in crime. So it is impossible to be moderate in any kind of vice. Alcoholism, nicotinism, caffeinism, morphinism, arsenic eating or any other type of drug eating or drug taking. You are simply poisoning yourself whether you take them in small quantities or in large quantities whether you take it in frequent doses or in infrequent doses. You're simply poisoning yourself, and there is no such thing as being moderate in poisoning yourself any more than there is such a thing as being moderate in cutting off the tips of your fingers. So when I say excess, I mean the overuse or overindulgence in the normal, the necessary, the wholesome, the useful things of life. You can be excessive in play, children often are. Many of us have no conception of our limitations. And if we get tired, if we get exhausted, if we don't feel good because we have exerted ourselves too much, we don't take the rest that fatigue is an indication we need. We take a stimulant and go on with our work or with our play, with our activity. We come home in the evening from a day of toil and a day of stimulation and we have a bath we need a rest, we need a diet of sleep. We take a stimulant and we go to the theater. We go to a bridge game. We go to a ball game. We keep up our activities far into the night. Then we come home, we have a little meal before we come in. We have another glass of beer. We have a few more cigarettes or a cigar. We go to bed and we roll and we toss on the bed all night. We complain that we can't sleep. No, you can't sleep under those conditions because you're suffering from so much poisoning that every nerve in your body is irritated and it is impossible for you to rest. It is impossible for you to relax. It is impossible for you to sleep. You may gain a certain state of semi-unconsciousness, but you'll get up in the morning with a dark brown taste in your mouth, feeling like the morning after the night before. <clears throat> 
You'll get up, you'll stretch a little, and you'll say, oh, I wish I could sleep for a month. And you'll go and have another cup of coffee to wake you up, an eye-opener, you call it. If you had good health, if you learned to conserve your energies, you'd get bounce out of that bed in the morning like a young colt. You wouldn't need an eye-opener. You wouldn't think that you needed an eye-opener. There's nothing in this world that is a better eye-opener than a night of good restful sleep. We dissipate our energies by not getting sufficient rest and sleep. Rest and sleep are nature's great representative, restorative or recuperative processes. Excitement and activity and work are nature's great representative, exhausting processes. Learn those two facts. Learn how to conserve your energies by resting, by relaxing, by sleeping. And how to conserve them by ceasing to dissipate those energies, by overworking, by overindulging, by stimulating yourselves with your various poison habits. And when you're ill, if you're foolish enough to become ill, There was a man who said not too many decades ago that the sick man is a rascal, and he advocated putting every man and woman who got sick into jail. He says these other culprits have only violated man-made laws. Uh, but the sick person has violated God-made laws. Let's put them in jail. Well, I don't think that's a good place for them myself. I've been in jail. I've been there more than once. I know what they're like. Dark, dingy, no sunlight, no fresh air, and a diet. Well, uh, I'd hate to describe the diet for you, but I'll tell you one thing. Nobody could live on it very long. It'd be a very bad place to put a sick man. It's a bad place to put anybody. Personally, I think we ought to batter down all of our jails and prisons in this country. Treat our criminals, as we call them, like we treat the other sick parts of our population. A criminal is only a sick man. He's morally sick rather than mentally or physically sick, but he's just a sick man. We ought to handle them as sick men, and I don't mean we should send them to the hospitals and operate on their brains. I don't mean we should drug them either, and dope them, and inoculate them, and make pin cushions out of them, or needle cushions, stick needles in them, and jab those needles way in there and squirt in some poison. You know, the symbol of the medical profession is a, is a rod with two wings and two snakes curled up. It's the best symbol I've ever seen in my life. They're snakes. <laughs> and I don't know anything that resembles the fangs of old Crotalus himself anymore. And there's the hypodermic needle of your position. <laughs> and every year, every year, there are a hundred times more people killed in this country by those hypodermic needles than die from rattlesnake bites. To get back if you have been foolish enough to permit yourself to become ill, then learn again the necessity, the increased necessity for conserving the energies you have and not permitting some so-called doctor. I don't care what school he belongs to to dissipate those energies by his repressive and stimulating measures. Whether they be physical or chemical, whether they be mental or thermal, it does not matter what kind they are. You need rest, not stimulation. And the sicker you are, the weaker you are, the greater is the need to conserve those energies, the greater the need for rest. Now, the grand secret of conservation of energy is very simple. There is two phases to it. One is stop dissipating your energies, and the other is get sufficient rest and sleep every day to fully recuperate from the expenditures of the day. 
If the amount of, if the time that you allot to sleep and repose each day is not sufficient to enable you to fully re recuperate from the day's activities, you start the next day with a deficit of energy. And if that is a continuous process, the time comes when you are so profoundly enervated that the organs of your body are incapable of carrying on their functions in a normal way. They may be 70% efficient, 50% efficient, or 20% efficient, but they're inefficient. And the toxic state of your body is in keeping with the, with the inefficiency of the functioning of those organs. Disease. Disease is built out of dissipation of energy. Recovery requires the recuperation of energy so that you can have the functioning power with which to carry on the functions of life, with which to, re to eliminate the toxins that are, have accumulated in your body. Now toxins accumulate in the bloodstream, but the body cannot permit them to stay there. So they're deposited in the fat, in the connective tissue, and in other tissues of the body. I'm sure that all of you have been have learned recently that cows in eating grass and other vegetation on which DDT has been sprayed, take up that DDT and take it into their bloodstreams and it, that it is deposited in the fat. And when the cow loses weight, as when, she, as when she is nursing her calf, the fat that is torn down in that process releases the DDT back into the bloodstream. And where do you think a lot of it goes? into the milk, passes out in the milk. The calf gets some of it, perhaps. Dairymen never let their calves suckle the cows anymore. But you get it. Your babies get it. And of course, they, they have to store it in the fatty tissues in their body to keep it out of circulation. The bodies of chronically ill peoples in this country are literally reeking with toxins that are stored in our tissues. That is the reason that it takes so long for them to get free of toxins when they go on a fast. If they only had to eliminate the toxins that circulate in their bloodstream, a day or two days or three days would be enough. But they've got to eliminate all these toxins that are stored in their tissues. And those toxins are thrown back into the bloodstream. When the tissues begin, the fatty tissues begin to break down in the fast. And sometimes so much fatty tissue is broken down and so many, so much toxins is released into the bloodstream at one time that the patient develops a crisis, a so-called acute crisis. It's not a matter of storing up these toxins, it's a matter of throwing them out of the tissues and getting them into the circulation where they can be carried to the organs of elimination for excretion. But often they're sent out through the respiratory tract and through the skin and through the liver. And I can tell you this, I have seen things come out of human beings through their livers that I, you could not in all your lifetime conceive of being in the human body and life still go on. But you can do that only by stopping eating and resting so that you can recuperate energy. Now how does a person begin to eliminate immediately upon the cessation of eating and going to bed? He, he's enervated, he hasn't got any energy, and all of a sudden, Within a few hours after you start the fast and the rest, you see the urine almost inky black. Prior to that, it was probably about the color of water. That indicates the great increase in activity on the part of the kidney. How does it do it? All right, we have up there a light. Let's assume that over there in that wall, we have a, a plug that is on the same circuit. We plug in an electric iron. We switch on the iron. What happens? Immediately, instantly, you see that light grow dim. Switch off the iron and immediately you see that light brighten up. <clears throat> now what has happened? When you switch on your iron, it means that the electric current that is coming over that particular, the electric electricity that is coming over that particular current is divided between two channels of outlet, two functions in other words. But when you switch off the iron, the energy that, the, or the electricity that is coming over that current is all expressed through one channel of outlet or through one function. So when we cease our physical activities, when we poise our minds, when we cease 
taking in food so that our digestive system is immobilized and at rest. All the energy that is commonly expended through these channels of activity is now available for use in the work of elimination. Consequently, that energy, when transferred to other channels, means an increased and a rapid expel expulsion of toxins. That can only come about by conserving our energies, not by co continuing their dissipation. Uh, I, I'm sorry that I've kept you here as long as I have. I, I know that you, most of you wanted to hear what I had to say about conserving human nature, human energy. I'm sorry that we were, I was put on the stand so late. <clears throat> I can stay here as long as you want to and answer questions if they want to have a question, period. <laughs> Thank you. Those who uh, feel enervated would like to go home and recharge their batteries may do so. Those who would like to stay for a while, Dr. Shelton has consented to answer questions for you. We'll have questions from the floor. Oral questions. I might announce that tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock in this room is the final lecture of the convention. And tomorrow night, banquet at 5.30. Please get your tickets tonight so that we can give the hotel a count on how many places you prepare. We have a wonderful floor show for you tomorrow night. The awarding of beautiful prizes for Miss Hygiene, Miss Natural Hygiene, Mr. Natural Hygiene, and so on. Also, there will be dancing. A wonderful show with wonderful people, with a wonderful crowd. continuing their dissipation. Uh, I, I'm sorry that I've kept you here as long as I have. I, I know that you, most of you wanted to hear what I had to say about conserving human nature, human energy. I'm sorry that we were, I was put on the stand so late. <clears throat> I can stay here as long as you want to and answer questions if they want to have a question, period. <laughs> Thank you. Those who uh, feel enervated would like to go home and recharge their batteries may do so. Those who would like to stay for a while, Dr. Shelton has consented to answer questions for you. We'll have questions from the floor. Oral questions. I might announce that tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock in this room is the final lecture of the convention. And tomorrow night, banquet at 5.30. Please get your tickets tonight so that we can give the hotel a count on how many plates to prepare. We have a wonderful floor show for you tomorrow night. The awarding of beautiful prizes for Miss Hygiene, Miss Natural Hygiene, Mr. Natural Hygiene, and so on. Also, there will be dancing. 
a wonderful show with wonderful people, with a wonderful crowd. But let's have your questions without any hesitation, without any embarrassment. If I can't answer the question, I'll tell you so. If I think I know the answer but I'm not sure, I'll tell you that too. <coughs> Uh, the question is this. She thinks, she heard correctly this afternoon that Dr. Esser believes that it's possible to live on a fruit diet, eating two or three or four kinds of fruits for a considerable period of time, while Dr. John Curcio thinks that one should not do that for more than two or three days at a time. I didn't hear the, three, the two statements, so I cannot say whether or not they, either one of them made these statements just exact, exactly as they were presented to me. I will say that there is a certain amount of difference of opinion among hygienists about how far a particular measure should be carried in particular cases. Uh, the, the peculiar thing about it is that Dr. John Curcio, in his particular mode of practice, is getting excellent results. And Dr. Esser, with a little, slightly different mode of practice, is also getting excellent results. There are, there are differences of opinion that time alone, with increasing knowledge, will iron out. Until that time comes, your people are going to have to tolerate a little difference of opinion. Uh, hygiene is not yet an exact science like mathematics. <laughs> so there will be, for some time to come, differences of opinion between us, and slight differences in fact. We are fully agreed, all of us, upon basic premises and principles. The variations that do exist and the differences of opinion that do exist are not basic. They are not fundamental. <coughs> I think Dr. John Curcio made the remark to me the other day about some of the people in our movement that they split the movement over a peanut. I think we should not make mountains out of these small molehills. <coughs> I, I, I have put many people on fruit diets and on juice diets for a considerable period. And I've seen some of them that after a few days on fruit develop crises that compel them to go on a fast. Others have gone on with their juices or their fruits without any such development. So it, se it has seemed to me that how long a particular type of issues out of these small things, so long as each individual sticks to his basic principles and the variations are as slight as that, I wouldn't make too much fuss about it. All right, we have another question. Yes? Do I fast? Yes, I do. Very often. There is nobody who can live so well, so nearly perfectly, in civilized life of today, but what he can profit by an occasional fast. And I take one or two short fasts a year just for cleansing purposes. All right, we have another question. Don't tell me everybody knows all he wants to know. Sometimes the only way for an undernourished patient to become well-nourished is to take a fast first. Some of these undernourished persons are eating their heads off. They're following all the diets that come along that are offered them. Some of them are very good diets, but they're not utilizing the diets. And after a fast, they do utilize their foods. And it's the, sometimes it's the shortest, the safest, and the only possible means to good nutrition. Now, you wanted to ask me. I've seen perhaps... I've seen perhaps eight or ten people during my 33 years of conducting fast who had long fast, not just ten days, but lengthy fast, and their tongues never coated. Only one of these failed to develop a foul breath. I don't know exactly how to account for that, but these patients made good progress on their fast in spite of the fact that the tongues didn't coat. All right, if we another cure. Yes, um, <coughs> are removed prior to a fast, is there any chance of regeneration of bone during I, the fast? Yes, if fillings of teeth are removed prior to the fast, 
Is there a chance of regeneration of bone during the fast? I do not think so. I've seen teeth heal, but only when the cavities or the breaks in the teeth were extremely small. After they've been drilled out by the dentist and fillings put in, I do not think there's any possibility of healing them, no matter what we do. Yeah. All right? What is a good cleansing diet? Were you here yesterday? <laughs> Dr. John Curcio discussed the so-called cleansing diet very thoroughly here yesterday and showed very fully that there is no such thing as a cleansing diet. If you want to really get cleaned out inside, the best cleansing diet in the world is distilled water. <clears throat> they aren't as long as necessary, but if it's going to be a lengthy period on that distilled water diet, be sure that you're under the supervision of somebody who knows how to conduct it, that's all. For a short fast of 10 days or two weeks, most of you are safe to take it on your own responsibility. All right, have we another question? The best way I know to curb a terrific appetite is to stop eating until... <laughs> That's the way to curb it. That's the way to curb it. In a 24 hours to 36 hours without food, you have no appetite. You'll go on with that fast until you're cleaned out and you'll start eating and that, ter that supposed terrific appetite will have, been, will have passed into history. I don't... Do I recommend a fast in stomach ulcer? I don't know anything that will result in the more rapid and the more certain healing of ulcers all along the digestive tract. Gastric ulcers, duodenal ulcers, and ulcers in the colon. Then a fast. And the same thing is true of ulcers in the bladder, ulcers in the gallbladder, ulcers in the womb, and ulcers on the external parts of the body. Yes? I don't use iron diagnosis. I, I, I'm not sure that there's more than one man in the hygienic field that does. We have discussed it with him, and inasmuch as it's, as far as its effect on the patient is concerned, perfectly harmless, we, we happen to expel that man from the hygienic field. All right, are we another question? Is this located exactly in a special method? He wants to know if there's a special method for correcting a dislocated sacroiliac. There is. That is a mechanical condition, and it is best corrected mechanically. A good uh, osteopath, a good chiropractor, a good hygienist, or even a good naturopath uh, would be able to handle that for you very easily and ver in most cases rather quickly. <clears throat> Her nails turn black all of a sudden. Well, I, I frankly, I don't know what caused it. <clears throat> I've seen a few discolored nails that cleared up when the tubation bloodstreams were cleared of their toxins. But I was never sure whether it was an ordinary toxemia or some type of drug poisoning that was, had caused the discoloration of the fingernails. And I'm not sure yet. Uh, Dr. Trump, what is the cause of premature gray hair and baldness, especially in young people? <clears throat> premature gray hair and baldness, especially in young people. I, I think he means me. I... <laughs> I'm still young. <laughs> I wish I knew something about hair. I don't, and I don't know anybody who does. <laughs> I can't tell you very much about it. I'm afraid I can't even answer your question, or try to answer your question. Um, when I take tea, I get dangerous. Or dangerous. Well, not everybody has that experience, but others have many other types of experiences. I find that if I have a glass of milk in the evening, I have a very foul mouth when I get up in the morning. I know a man who can drink a glass of, of milk, and by the time he can reach the bathroom, he, it passes out through his colon. 
not coagulated. It just goes through him like uh, water. Uh, I know others who take uh, milk and they're constant. One glass of milk will constipate them for two or three days. If you find that you can't handle milk, I don't know of anything better than to stop using it. All right, away, another question. Well, that depends entirely on, on individuals and circumstances. Upton Sinclair, in his book on the fasting cure, makes this statement, that the person who needs frequent fast is like the man who has a leak in the roof of his house and who, instead of repairing the leak, contents himself with mopping up after every rain. If you have to have frequent fast, it means that you're living between the fast in such a way that you're creating that need all the time. Most people, I mean healthy people, who are living intelligently shouldn't need more than one cleansing or two cleansing fasts a year at most. If you're sick, uh, then, of course, how many fasts you need during the course of the year uh, will de be determined by your general condition and by the length of the fast each time that you take it. All right, we have another question. Osteoarthritis be healed by a fast. Fasting doesn't heal anything. Fasting doesn't even do anything. And diet doesn't heal anything. Fasting is a fasting is a period of rest, physiological rest. It is time out from activities to give the body an opportunity to eliminate its toxins, its accumulated waste. After these are eliminated, Healing can take place. Osteoarthritis does heal after cause is removed. Cause being a toxic condition. Yes. Now, there are limitations to all things. I'm getting a lot of questions about fasting here this evening, and Dr. John Curcio is going to discuss it tomorrow morning. 90% uh, of what I say you're not going to remember, so I have a book on fasting out there on the desk that I would recommend that each of you get and study. But this I would say, there are limitations to all things, even to what fasting can do. A lady here in the audience, I, she may not be here right now, brought a prospective patient to be in the hall here yesterday afternoon. He has diabetes. He has had it for a number of years. He has been taking insulin for a number of years. She brought him to me and she said, can't you do something for him? And I asked him, how long have you been taking insulin? He told me. I said, I wouldn't touch you with a 10-foot pole. You can't come to my place for care. The use of insulin brings about such deterioration of structure and functional power in the pancreas that it's dangerous to take those poor fellows off their, their crutch if they have been taking it over a very long period of time. So I make it a practice never to accept a diabetic patient that has been receiving insulin for two years or more. So we have limitations, but that lady could not understand that there are limitations. Why can't you restore him to health by fasting? Why? It's like asking me, why can't you grow this man a new leg after he's lost one in a, in a railroad wreck or something of kind by putting him on a fast? You just can't do it. There are limitations, and we must learn to recognize those limitations and not try to accomplish by fasting that which can only be done by sunshine or by exercise. All right, have we another question? I think the climate bugaboo has been very much overworked. I'll tell you the formula for climate. If you live in the north, they send you south. If you live in the south, they send you north. If you live in the east, they send you west. If you live in the west, they send you east. If you live in a damp climate, they send you to a dry climate. And if you live in a dry climate, they send you to a damp climate. And if you live in the lowlands, they send you to the uplands. And if you live in the uplands, they send you to the lowlands. Wherever you are is the wrong place. You should be somewhere else. And when you go to the new climate, you take all your bad habits along with you so you don't get well. Climate hasn't anything to do with habit. Of course they do. They run them off 
They sent them to another climate to get them out of the way so the other patients can't ask troublesome questions. Why doesn't that patient get well? He's been coming around here for five years. Can't you do anything with him, doctor? If the doctor would tell the truth, he'd say, well, that patient's putting my son through medical college. <laughs> Have we another question? I haven't read the recent works of Kenyon Clemente. Better known as, I mean, properly known as George E. Clements, former editor of How to Live magazine. He writes under that name because he cannot send his stuff through the mails under his own name. <coughs> I haven't read them, so I can't say anything pro or con about them. Have we another question? Uh, Dr. Shelton, what do you think of the milk diet? As, uh, explained in Vernon McFadden's The, the milk diet milk. is a wonderful diet for a baby. For an adult, well, I think you're old enough to be weaned, don't you? <laughs> I saw a hand back there. Excessive sunshine and excessive contact with the air, especially if it's blowing, will result in the drying of the skin. Do you work semi-nude? You're a lifeguard. Well, uh, is it absolutely necessary that you be at all times uncovered, or isn't there some way that you can keep yourself protected from excessive exposure to the sun and still be available for saving the young girl when she insists on being saved? Uh, well, I meant, couldn't you, couldn't you put some kind of a thin, thin robe or something over your shoulders that would protect you, rather than resorting to these greases? I don't think they're of any val re real value. All right, have we another question? Everybody wears sunglasses down here. I wonder if you'd say a few words about those. A few, few years ago, I, I drove into a place, and there was a little girl there, and she came out to my car, and, and she was blinking and blinking, and I, I knew the girl, and I said, what's the matter with your eyes? She says... Well, I, I can't see well. I'm going to have to go and have some eye, eyeglasses fitted. And I said, uh, you know what's wrong with your eyes? He said, no. I said, sunglasses. Throw those things away and stay away from the oculus. So she took my advice. And within a week, all that squinting and all that or closing of the eyes and all of her eye troubles had disappeared. Sunglasses actually place a strain upon the eye. It is more difficult to see through dark glasses than through glasses that are not dark, and it's certainly more dis uh, difficult to see through them than it is to see without them. They are injurious to the eye, and the sunshine is not going to injure your eye. When you're uh, on a trip, you're driving, and the of the sun hitting on the road ahead of you, shines in your eyes all day long. In a case like that, wouldn't sunglasses remove some of the strain of the glare? In the first place, it's not possible unless you drive east all morning and west all evening to have the sun glare in your eyes all day long. As a matter of fact is, the sun glare would be chiefly in your eyes in the early part of the day and in the late part of the day, depending on which way you're going. I have driven all over this country, and I do my driving in the daytime, and I have as much of that glare in my eyes as anybody else, and I never use sunglasses nor tinted glasses nor anything else, and I've never found that it hurt my eyes in any way. I wore them about four to nine years old. And I asked, even when I was uh, 59, why I, I, I was retired a year before I was full of the car. I rode to Baltimore, and I worked as a shipping clerk, and a steam clerk, and a help store was on, and I wanted to learn that side of the world. That side of the world. So I did. They had sold it. They had seen one bit, and I'm nearly 70 years old. I'm sure it wouldn't. I tell you how, if you want, if you want sunshine to hurt your eyes, I'll tell you a simple recipe to make it do it. 
go into a dark room where no ray of light penetrates, and stay in there for about three weeks, and then come out at midday. <laughs> Darkness is more likely to injure your eyes than light. All right, we have another question. Doc, what about living on air we've been hearing about lately? I think that is hot air. <laughs> of course, we have to have air to live. It's a vital food, as vital as calcium. Oxygen, I should say, as vital as calcium or protein or anything else. But the idea that you can live on air, go on living on air. We hear about a woman over in Germany that's been living on air for nine years. It's like some of these, some of these, uh, Hindus that are up in the Hawaiian mountains over in India that are a thousand years old and three thousand years old. That's hot air, too. <laughs> All right, your question. No, I believe my sister, I'll make me Jewish as my mom. Is it all right to live on liquid juices for months? <laughs> I don't think so. <clears throat> uh, this, this juice business. Dr. Troll pointed out the evils of drinking these juices a long time ago. The early hygienists had experiences with juice diets and juice, fa juice feasts and the juice fad a long time ago. They found them to be wanted. They were discarded. A few years ago, they were revived by the peddlers of juice-making ma machines. And you people have been juiced into everything. Carrot juice is almost a panacea. Celery juice, cucumber juice, potato juice, orange juice, grape juice, all kinds of juices. You've been guzzling them instead of beer and Coca-Cola. And you take them in large quantities. I had a woman come to me once from Pittsburgh. And she was sick, and she was weak, and she needed rest. And she said, they put me on a juice diet. And I, I spent so much time in the kitchen making juice that I wore myself out. <clears throat> now, why drink the juice of an apple when you can eat the apple and get all of the value of the apple? Why waste so much excellent food? You drink tomato juice to get vitamins. And there's more vitamins left in the pulp of the tomato than you take out in the juice. Why not eat the whole tomato? Get all of its value. Now you fill up on juice. I, you know, I've seen these people drink so much juice that you can go up and stick your finger in their cheek or in their elbow, or in their shoulder or somewhere, and you can make a great indentation in there. Take it half an hour to fill out again. Waterlogged tissues from overconsumption of fluids. Drinking it by the, in great quantity. It's all right to have a glass of juice now and then. I drank a glass, too. But uh, what have you got teeth for? To drink juice with? We've got chewing mechanism. We don't have to have blenders and juice extractors and food choppers. You run a head of lettuce through a food chopper or a blender, and in just 60 seconds, one short minute, 80% of the vitamin C in that lettuce is destroyed by oxidation. Slice your tomatoes. Let the oxygen of the air to the inner structure of the tomato, and oxidation of vitamins begins there too, and in a short time they're destroyed. Why go to all this trouble to concoct all these juices and hash up all your foods when it's such a simple matter to take them in your hands and eat them without all that trouble, without all that work. A true emancipation of woman will come when we take her out of the kitchen. <laughs> Some of them spend eight and ten hours a day in there washing a lot of greasy pots and pans, standing over a hot stove, grinding food and mixing up indigestible combinations that would produce ulcers in the stomach of, a, of an ostrich. All because we are going to get well this way. And perhaps they are keeping themselves sick by worry or by overwork. 
or by jealousy because their husband was flirt is flirting with that dizzy blonde down the street. All right, we another question. The best exercises I know to strengthen the abdominal walls would be, for example, to lie down on the floor or on your bed, on your back, hook your feet under the foot of your bed or under the foot of the dresser, put your hands behind your head and raise up to a sitting position. Lie down on the floor without your feet being under that bed or dresser and bring your feet up to a perpendicular position, your legs, I mean, and down, then the other and both of them at the same time. You can repeat these as often as your strength and your endurance permits and gradually increase the number of repetitions. And I'll tell you this, that if you keep it up, you can have an abdominal wall that is so strong and so hard that you can stand the strongest blow that your breast fin can strike in your, in your abdomen, if you see what I mean. <laughs> All right, we another question. I don't believe at all in drugs. Oh, all right. Well, I, I keep away from it, too, as best I can. But yet I have found, when I got seriously ill, Karen Silver was in the trick. Now, I've been fighting a two-month minute over, may I say it? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. I've, uh, I've had Lyme Jones since over two You still have it? I still have it. Yes. Had. And uh, I have... Uh, uh, recently got the shot of hell in the and I have the violence and it painted my throat. And it seems that it has released the condition and no voice at all. Now, you see what we have here? We have a lady who has not divorced herself from the ancient thought of the voodoos that disease can be remedied without removing its cause. There is some kind of a magic concoction that the old witch can brew in her cauldron in the cave. Now, I mean the old witch. Uh, th in these days, we don't call the cave a cave. We call it a laboratory. And they don't dress up with all this savage paraphernalia. They put on white aprons and they have boots and burners and a lot of other things. But it's still, nonetheless, the, w the cave of the old witch. And they're still concocting uh, their magic potions to remedy disease without removing its cause. She took some penicillin and, and she thinks that it helped her. If she had gone three days without food, she would have been well. Turn the cassette. If she had gone three days without food, she would have been well. I've done that. I've laid in bed four days without food. I've rested and took my turn easily. All right. If four days aren't enough, take five. I get patients down there at my place sometimes that can't get well with ten days of fasting, so I give them twenty. And if 20 isn't enough, I give them 30. I had one fellow that took 90 days. And he's still living. <laughs> if it takes a little more time. No, he wasn't in jail. He was in my place. Which one comes first? So long as the organs of elimination function efficiently, they keep the blood and lymph stream pure and sweet. When functional efficiency is lowered, then there begins an accumulation of waste in the body. So long as the body is main, has normal nerve energy, function will be normal and no toxemia will develop. So innervation comes first. Then, after you have become toxemic, the toxemia itself produces more innervation. So it's innervation plus toxemia plus more innervation plus toxemia and around and around the vicious circle you go and you never get out of it until you learn how to stop the production of the innervation. All right, have we another question? Uh, how do you remove cataracts from the eyes? How do I remove cataracts from the eyes? Well, I've had several cases of cataracts and I've had two in which I failed all the rest of them, I succeeded in remedy. And I did it by withholding all food until the cataract was absorbed. What is your theory on the source of energy? I don't know the source of energy. There are several theories, and I've read them all, and I'm not fully satisfied with any of them. And I can't say that I have a theory. 
All right. Not always. Some people handle pot cheese in their particular state of digestive impairment much easier than to do nuts. I do not think that means that the pot cheese is the best for them. I think it means that they need to get their digestive uh, function restored to normal so they can eat the nuts. Allergy. I think allergy is a blanket term used by the physicians to cover their ignorance of what's wrong with you. Uh, allergy, in my opinion, is indigestion. Was there a question coming from the Did you say that the Negro is constituted differently to take the sun? I see them labor in the hot sun all day long on a conventional diet. Yes, the Negro can... The Negro contain, has in his skin a heavy, dark pigment that protects him from the sun's rays, just as a heavy tanning protects you. Even so, all day in the sun is not good for the Negro, nor is it good for the heavily tanned white person. We call ourselves white. We're not really. Uh, if we're really healthy, we're pink. <laughs> Who told you? Yes. A chiropractor told her that she does not have a toxic bone, and it's possible that a lack of calcium destroyed it. Well, if she doesn't have one, it must have been destroyed, or she must never have developed it before birth. And if, in either case, there is a probability of a deficiency of some kind. But we, I think we stress calcium deficiency often when there's some other kind of deficiency rather than the calcium deficiency that are responsible. And more often than otherwise, the so-called deficiency is the result of a toxic state of the body, which causes a failure to assimilate and utilize food rather than there being a lack of it in the diet. All right? Have we another question? I, I think that you misunderstood his question. He wanted to know if the Negro was constituted differently to the white man so that he could stand, withstand more sun than the white man. And I answered his question properly. What you say is strictly true, that the healthy individual eating properly can withstand more sun than the person who is not well or who is not eating properly. But that doesn't have any relation to the question that he asked. All right, have we another question? Just a minute, let me get this lady first. Is it all right for an elderly person to do exercise? How old do you mean? I'd say it's all right up to 105 anyhow. <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to be here to follow it up. No, no, no. I mean, what would you roughly say the right thing to do? My plan, if I had you under my care, would be to put you in bed and give you all the distilled water that your thirst demanded and keep you on that diet until all of your symptoms had disappeared and your tongue cleared up and your hunger returned and your breath was sweet and the urine was clean and the blood circulation was normal and all your secretions were normal, then I'd feed you properly give you exercise, and so on. Have we another question? Uh, two days ago, you mentioned uh, the DDT is not stored sufficiently in the liver of an animal to endanger the milk, if I understood it right. No, I, I got a question about that after, and you may have set up the question. I didn't get to the... You mentioned the DDT gets in the fat of the animal.
probably goes through the liver first, yes. But the, point, the statement I made was this, that there is no minimum dose below which, if the animal takes food with that small a dose in it, there is no storage in the, in the fat. In other words, no matter how little there is on the, on the food that the animal takes daily, no matter how little the amount, if it's taken regularly, there will be a storage in the fat of the animal. That was the statement I made. I knew that whoever sent in the question had gotten my statement wrong. All right, we another question. I think the chemistry of all all different the different races varies more because of the differences in their dietary habits than because of any racial differences. Uh, for example, we know very well that we can change the odors of the human body. I mean of the same individual by changing his diet. Yes? Salt water doesn't react. The body acts to expel the salt. But salt, it, it eliminates salt with, with difficulty. So it tends to accumulate in the tissues. And it stores it under the in the tissues under the skin and in some of the other parts of the body and dilutes it with water and holds it there. It'll sort of throw a lot of it out through the kidneys and a lot of it out through the skin, however. Oh, yeah, internally. I, I, I don't know that it makes any, any, has any particular deleterious effect taking occasional salt water baths or swims. Uh, can you refer to any uh, data, insightful data, on whether or not chemicals are cumulative in the body. Many of them are known to be cumulative. Any standard textbook of pharmacology will give you a whole raft of factual data on it. I, I would suggest to you that you get Bastido's uh, material medical pharm uh, pharmacology and therapeutics. He is professor of these subjects in Columbia University. It's a standard textbook used in medical colleges. Any standard textbook, however, will give you an abundance of evidence of that kind. Uh, pardon me just a minute. Uh, instead of giving me your biography or your autobiography, would you mind asking your question because there's a lot more uh, questions to be asked than this. It's perfectly all right to be tanned all the time. It's the excessive sunbathing that we're talking about here as being harmful. <clears throat> Do you believe the body has the ability to convert inorganic substances to usable? No, sir, not at all. Blood counts are not intended to determine toxic poisoning. Blood counts are intended to determine, are intended to determine how many blood cells you have in the blood. And that is, that is intended to determine whether or not you're anemic, are low in blood count, not to determine the amount of toxins that are in the blood at all. All right, are we another question? Uh, what would you say to a man who smoked and doesn't survive and not to be able to have a drink? Well, I, I would say that no such thing ever took place. Now, you see, you made that question bigger than you probably, probably think. You said smoking 12 cigars a day up until the age of 85 without having any effect on him. That never took place. The man that can smoke cigars, 12 cigars a day, until the age of 85 and be in perhaps what might be called a reasonably fair state of health, but who will die before he's 90, that same man, if he leaves off the cigarettes, or I mean the cigars, might live in still better health until he's 110. There is one thing we can say, cigar, cigar and cigarette smoking never increased anybody's life. There's another question right here somewhere, I believe. There are no hereditary diseases. There are hereditary tendencies, I believe, 
towards the development of particular diseases. But diseases do not develop without cause. And cause, heredity, is not a cause of anything. It is merely a means of transmission from one generation to the next of characteristics inherent in the germplasm. All right, have we another question? Now I didn't get all of that question. Would you mind repeating it? <laughs> I, I would. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't approve of them. Uh, on general principles, I haven't seen them. I haven't seen any use of them. I haven't seen any specific results following their use. But on general principles, I wouldn't approve of them. All right, it's getting late. Uh, if we've got the $64 question, I'll answer that one before we adjourn. Go ahead. You want to eat fruit? I think that every hygienist, every hygienist that you have ever met or ever heard of, insisted upon fruit as an essential part of the human diet. Uh, I think some of you have the idea that because Dr. Giancurcio has emphasized the evil of overeating of fruit and the evil of overtaking of fruit juices, that he, uh, uh, he condemns fruit eating. He doesn't. I, I've been staying down there with him for the last few days, and he and I both have eaten a lot of fruit. And we're going to eat some more. All right, we another question. Then let's take a rising... All right, one more. Were you a blonde when you were younger? Blondes cannot stand as much sunshine as brunettes. Redheads are even more vulnerable to sunshine than blondes. Fat people are usually less... Re can usually take less sun than thin ones. There are various types of, of impaired conditions of the body, too, that make it more necessary that we exercise care in taking our sun baths. For example, people with heart trouble have to be careful. People nervous cases have to be more careful. People suffering with asthma have to be more careful in their sunbathing than other people. There are various pathological states that render us unable to take sun as well as the other thought. Well, not always. Not always. They don't, I'm, I'm pointing out that blondes can't take very much of it anyhow. All right, now I suggest that we all take a rising vote on adjournment. Come back tomorrow morning. What time is the tomorrow morning's meeting, Doctor? 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. We have to we have to interrupt we have to interrupt the regular program for for about ten minutes with a special guest speaker that has come to us. <coughs> Dr. Shelton has asked me to present her. Mrs. Nell Foster Rogers is with us this morning. She and her husband wrote a little booklet last year called Medical Mischief. She is from Gainesville, Florida. She has been in the forefront of the fight for medical freedom for many years, and at the present time, she is a registered lobbyist for the public, I believe, at Tallahassee. She's putting on a very active fight. <coughs> I would like to have Mrs. Rogers come forth a moment, and I will ask her to limit her talk to 10 minutes, please. Mm -hmm. I probably have to say. Okay. <laughs> Before Mrs. Rogers starts her talk, come in, please. I can let you know that we have about four seats down here for some of you folks, or the ladies back there, that may want seats. Thank you very much. Now, kindly give Mrs. Rogers your, your kind attention. Thank you. Well, I may be a little hesitant because I traveled all night and I'm rather tired. <laughs> but what I wanted to talk to you about is 
the importance of this group of people who believe in hygiene to help us at Tallahassee to protect that hygiene legally. You can't realize, unless you're there and see the bills that are presented at that uh, legislature uh, by the medical uh, men, you can't realize how dangerous or how much in danger your liberty of being able to be hygienists is threatened. Now this, uh, well, in 1949, there were two bills introduced by the State Board of Health that uh, were for the very purpose of outlawing um, any natural hygiene or, well, there's really uh, naturopathy that they were after. But when they get that, then they get next thing to your hygiene, too. And uh, they were both defeated in the in committee. But each year since then, there's some bill or other comes up. This year, there were two bills. One was to prevent the, uh, hi any hygienists or any, anything but medical doctors from having conducting nursing uh, uh, clinics or anything like that. They must all be under the domination of the medics. Well, one doctor, one nat uh, naturopathic doctor, Rex Smith from Jacksonville, is practically the only person there besides myself that is doing anything to protect the liberties of the people. He has defeated two or three bills already this year. He was a lawyer. He seems, according to his registration, to be conducting it all himself. He registers for himself, and the, his lawyer is registered as paid by, for by him. The Christian scientists have a, a, a lobbyist on the grounds from, start, from the beginning of the legislature to the end. But all he looks out for is medical, or is religious liberty, and he pays no attention to the general public. But I hope that I can get you to see how important it is for you to save your liberties while you still got them, instead of letting them go like they have in the North, where you're having to beg people then to help us to protect the man who's already in trouble. At the present time, we've got no trouble here if you'll just continue to protect it. Now, this one of the bills that they put up here just last week was, uh, well, it provided a trap for any man who would put, uh, put a doctor to his name. If he uh, signed his name doctor, used the word, the uh, title doctor, why, he had to sign at the end, whether it was an N.D., an M.D., a Ph.D., or what, and the name of the school from which he graduated. Well, if he failed to do that three times, he could be, his license could be taken away from him. Now, you see how that works. A medical man wouldn't need to be afraid because the medical men are looking out for the medics and they have control of the machinery of the state. But if a chiropractor or a naturopath or anybody who wanted to, that they wanted to get a hold of, did it, then they could clamp down on them. There was a bill in, uh, there was a law on the statutes of uh, Michigan that read like this. It described it, it, the uh, practice of medicine. It told what all constituted the practice of medicine until the last sentence it says, in fact, anything that is done to relieve the suffering of a human being may be construed as the practice of medicine. So if you are a naturopath, if you are a hygienist or a chiropractor that the medics wanted to suppress, if you went into a person's house and that patient says, will you kindly adjust this pillow? Will you kindly give me a drink of water? They could say that they were, viol they were practicing medicine without a license and suppress them and put them in jail. 
Now, I, that's about all I've got. I have some papers, though, that cover the, um, my work at Tallahassee. And if you would like to, anybody would be interested in seeing some of the bills that I have touched on, I'd be glad to give the papers as long as they last. And I hope that you will try to see that you, one of your members, if you could arrange to have some member of your organization go there to Tallahassee and register for the purpose of, uh, of helping us, it would greatly really appreciate. Oh, I did want to mention, before both houses of the legislature right now is a bill to uh, force voluntary tuberculosis patients to remain in the hospitals against their wishes. Dr. Brock, the uh, medical director of Orlando Tuberculosis Hospital, <coughs> condemned the bill in a lecture that he gave at Gainesville. He says that a man who has it seldom ever gives it to his wife. A woman who has it seldom ever gives it to her husband. And when he says seldom, that means that they can't prove that they ever do it. And if it, is, if it is no more contagious than that, why destroy our precious liberty for the sake of something that we can't agree on? Medical doctors have never agreed upon, agreed upon it. And uh, many of them say it's not contagious, whatever. And yet, through the fear of disease, they're using that fear of disease to take all of our liberties away from us. And I think that the most important thing in the world is liberty. Do you remember Benjamin Rush, who, who was a medical doctor and signed the Declaration of Independence? He, he founded medical, Rush Medical College, too. He begged them to include medical liberty as well as religious liberty in the constitutional guarantees of liberty, in the Bill of Rights. They, nobody could see the importance of it but the doctor. So they didn't do it. Now you see where we are. We've got no medical liberty. And he was very right. Well, I thank you for your attention. And as I say, I'll have some... Thank you, Mrs. Rogers. And to get back to our program, ladies and gentlemen, I want to touch on Dr. Curcio's talk, which he just finished. I want to tell you that I fasted 22 days last year. Believe me when I tell you, these wonderful men, they can't stand up and boost fasting because you'll say they're commercial. I can tell you that fasting is the only way to restore health to the human being. And as Dr. Curcio says, before you fast, get your mind in the right mental frame. Buy Dr. Shelton's book on fasting or anybody's book on fasting that we know is an authority. And I assure you that you'll thank your lucky stars that you found fasting. We now have a treat in store for you. We have a symposium on the care of children. And I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that about eight years ago, I met this gentleman that I'm going to introduce to you next. I wasn't feeling well. I had gone to see all the doctors in New York and in different cities. And I found that they couldn't help me. I was to the biggest medical institutions at all kinds of tests. They were unable to help me. I, somebody finally recommended me to Dr. Robert Anderson, who at that time was, had camp hygiology in Montrose, New York. I thank the day that I found Dr. Anderson and natural hygiene. And now, without further ado, I want to introduce to you a great soul, and I want you to give him a real support and give him your kind attention. Of course, this is the last morning of fasting of this convention. Dr. Robert Anderson of Rhinebeck, New York. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. 
fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen. This morning we're, we're dealing with a subject that some of you may not be vitally interested in, others will be more than interested. Those young married people, the wife of, uh, of which has spent her time in an office, or earning a livelihood, and has done so since high school, has probably never given the thought of how to take care of the home and the babies. And at the time she becomes pregnant, she goes and depends on a doctor who does not believe, as a rule, in natural birth or breastfeeding. This may not be true everywhere, but in the city of New York or in New York State, uh, the uh, natural birth has been ridiculed and breastfeeding is thought unnecessary. Of course, back of this are the people who produce the uh, baby foods that are prepared, overcooked. They're easy, they're economical because each one contains sufficient for a meal. And uh, uh, they, the mothers are so easily seduced by these ideas that it doesn't take any time. It's so easy. All you have to do is open the, the bottle after you put it in some hot water and feed the baby. You can take it anywhere, on the train, on the boat, wherever you go. Here is a note of warning. Those unfamiliar with the procedure of fasting should not attempt to fast without proper supervision. A crisis may develop. Also, improper breaking of a long fast can result in death. 